Hey, welcome back to the channel. In this week's lecture, we're going to take everything that we've learned about refractive error, and now we're going to apply it to Rx interpretation. Hey, Sean here from modernoptician.com, where we help student opticians achieve their goals through books, study guides, and online videos just like this one. So if you've seen value in this video, make sure you smash a like button, subscribe, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of the videos as they drop. Now, let's jump into the lecture about RX interpretation. And welcome into the lecture about RX interpretation. So today's lecture is all about being able to take a prescription and within seconds, knowing exactly what's going on with the patient's vision and being able to know exactly what refractive errors are present and all the nuances that accompany it. Now, if you've been doing this for some time and you've been working in the dispensary, this might seem a little trivial to you, but we have to recognize that we have students along with us for this journey that may just be starting off. So this is definitely something that is uh, a concept that we should know right away and it helps us in understanding uh, you know, our patients and making the best recommendations. I will make the recommendation, however, that even though if you're, you know, if you're well along your studies, I still suggest you watch this because you know, these are the low hanging fruits. These are the easy things that you wouldn't want to miss a concept. Uh, and sometimes it's just nice to hear it explained in a different way. So uh, if you are pretty good at Rx interpretation, please bear with me here for this lecture. Um, and who knows, maybe you'll still really enjoy it. So why don't we jump into it? And of course, before we jump into it, as always, quick reminder that if you do want to dig deeper into these concepts, make sure to check out the study guides for apprentice opticians available on Amazon and also on modernoptician.com. Exam season is fast approaching and these are great study guides and resources to help make sure you've got all the concepts under your belt. All right, so let's move on to the lecture itself. All right, let's cover some of the simple stuff here. We have a standard prescription in front of us and let's go over some of the conventions that you should be familiar with. Uh, this is pretty simple stuff. All the textbooks you'll be studying will kind of outline this kind of stuff and we're just going to do kind of a, a quick glaze over of what little things we should always be remember, remembering about the prescriptions. So first of all, the unit of measure is in diopters and usually things are going to be prescribed in quarter diopters. So, you know, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. Um, it can be prescribed in eight diopters. So 0 0.125 or, you know, sometimes rounded to down to one point, sorry, 0 0.12 or 0.13. You see less and less of that nowadays, with the exception of uh, compensated prescriptions or freeform lenses that get real granular and real specific. Therefore, it is important to keep in mind that it can be an eighth diopters. However, pr uh, prescribed, never really prescribed in eighth diopters anymore, mostly quarter diopters. Uh, sphere power can be plus or minus. You will see it prescribed in both directions all the time and we'll go into more detail as to why that is. Cylinder can also be written as a plus or minus. However, in this particular case, as an optician, you always want it in minus. We will do a lecture on transposition converting from plus cylinder to minus cylinder and back and forth. However, for the time being, just remember that it can be written both forms but you always want it in a minus cylinder. Very, very important. Ophthalmic lenses are always produced in minus, minus cylinder form. Therefore, your prescription must be interpreted in minus cylinder. Uh, the axis can be written between uh, 0, 0, 1, which is one degree, and 180 degrees, which can also uh, symbolize zero degrees. And this is always going to be written in this form. And it's always written in three digits as well. Uh, so, you know, you shouldn't be written as just one. And this is just convention to avoid confusion and uh, interpretation. Sometimes handwriting can be a little sloppy. So having the three digits helps insinuate what axis degree uh, it is being prescribed in. And add power is always plus. Um, and usually the same for both eyes. However, this is not an absolute must. Sometimes you will de see dissimilar ads. However, it is quite rare. Most of the time they are prescribed 
in the same magnitude for both eyes. And prism is prescribed in prison diopters and is always accompanied by a base direction. So we'll discuss that in more detail when we go over prism in a future lecture. However, prism without a base direction is pretty useless to the dispenser because you don't know what to do with it. It's always accompanied with a base direction. So this is kind of those simple conventions that you should always keep in mind. And I'm sure most of you already know these things, but it was worth mentioning. Let's jump into the bulk of what we really want to talk about, how to interpret the numbers that are within this prescription. Okay, so here we are. We've got the prescription again. So the main purpose of this lecture is to take a look at the prescription and to be able to decipher exactly what the vision impairment is, what, what the patient's experience is within a few seconds. Any experienced optician can grab a prescription and within seconds know exactly what's going on from what refractive error is going on with the patient to what their visual experience is, what the recommendations should be, and you too should get good at this, be able to grab it, interpret it, and then you know go off to the races. So let's jump in part by part and discuss exactly what uh, we're looking at here. So the sphere power. The sphere power is your main representation of what the primary primary refractive oh this pen refractive error is okay so whenever you take a look at the sphere power this is going to give you an idea of whether the person is myopic or hyperopic so minus power is going to be a myopic prescription and plus power is going to be hyperopic and i apologize about the handwriting here but i think that you get the kind of gist of it so remember when you see plus power you know it's a hyperope you see minus power you know it is a myope in the case of cylinder and axis these guys go hand in hand because the cylinder is the is the the cylinder power and the axis is the orientation of that power this here is going to denote astigmatism so as soon as you see cylinder correction and is always going to be accompanied by an axis you know that this patient has astigmatism so astigmatism not motism matism and uh like we mentioned previously this is going to be always want well you're always going to want it in a minus uh, however, if it's in a plus, it needs to be converted to the minus. Uh, and we're going to go into a little bit more detail in the next slide. However, depending on the type of correction in relation to the sphere, this is where you're going to be able to tell whether a prescription is simply myopic or if the person is suffering from simple astigmatism or compound astigmatism. And sometimes even mixed. And if you're not 100% sure as to what I'm talking about here, make sure to check out the lecture on astigmatism. All those things will be revealed as far as the differences between simple compound and mixed astigmatism. And finally, prism. Prism denotes some form of binocular vision dysfunction. Okay. And the unique thing about PRISM is that it's not always going to be abundantly clear as to what that dysfunction is. It could be some kind of accommodative uh, dysfunction where things aren't working out for near vision. It can also be a phoria or a tropia, some type of strabismus. At the end of the day, it's not particularly important for you in this particular step of Rx interpretation. It's simply to recognize that there's something going on, some type of pathology or mechanical issue that is causing the two eyes to not work together and prism cannot be overlooked it absolutely has to be corrected um, and of course you require a base direction uh, when prism is being prescribed so you can see things like bd being base down bu base up base in or base out. These things must be accompanied and you would typically get like, let's say two diopters and sometimes you have a triangle which represents prism. However, these are all the things. So you see, we, we took a couple minutes to look at this. However, 
in a very brief moment, you can see all these things and know exactly what's going on. If you see plus, you know it's hyperopic. If you see some cylinder, you know they're, they have astigmatism. And you know uh, with prism that they're going to have some kind of binocular dysfunction. And last but not least, we want to make sure that we do mention the ad. And the ad insinuates that accommodation is not working out the way it used to. And this implies presbyopia. With the exception of sometimes children or young adults may be prescribed an ad to assist in things like binocular vision dysfunction or just simply accommodative dysfunction and things like that. So it's not a foolproof assumption. However, if you do see a patient who is middle-aged or beyond and they have an ad, it is pretty safe to assume that they are presbyopic. So there you have it, your framework for interpreting a prescription. Why don't we jump into the next slide and look at some examples and see how quickly and effectively we can discern what's going on with each patient. All right, so in this slide, we are going to go through four different examples, four different prescriptions, and we're going to quickly look at what refractive errors are present, and we're just going to do a quick mention of what kind of visual experience these patients are likely experiencing, and maybe mention a quick recommendation. However, uh, these recommendations, and I don't want, uh, before I go too deep into this, I do want to mention recommendations should be based on lifestyle and, and visual requirements and things like that. So it, it's unfair to just say, here's what we're going to recommend for this person. However, sometimes it's pretty straightforward and obvious, uh, and I'll try my best to kind of discern between the two kind of circumstances. So we're going to go th through four examples, and you get to watch me try to fit all this with my lousy pen here. Uh, so hopefully I can pull this off. So example one, we have the right eye, OD. Oh, I didn't mention OD and OS. I mean, again, I shouldn't assume, but I think most of us by this point recognize that OD and OS signify right eye and left eye, uh, ocular dexter and ocular sinister. Um, so anyways, moving into the refractive elements of this. So we know that the sphere power is a minus one on the right eye, a minus one on the left eye. We have a minus 0 0.75 cylinder with a 175 axis. There is nothing in the prism and there's nothing in the ad. So within seconds, you should be able to recognize that this person is myopic um, and that they have astigmatism. So why don't we note this? So we're going to say myopic with astigmatism. And one thing that I always want everybody to, two things actually. First thing is ask yourself what type of astigmatism, because as we mentioned in the lecture on astigmatism, not every single astigmatic patient will have the same experience. Uh, in this particular case, it is compound astigmatism, right? And in this case, the astigmatism will only worsen the myopic effect. And I also, second thing, is that I always want you to kind of think of things in a spherical equivalent. So in this particular case, if you remember your spherical equivalence equation, I guess I'll write it down real quick here. It would be your sphere power plus half the cylinder. In this particular case, the cylinder doesn't divide equally. It's about 37 and a half, sorry, 0 0.375 um, diopters. So in this case, again, we're not correcting the spherical equivalent. So you can use it in eighth diopters and whatever. It doesn't really matter. But in this particular case, this works out to be a lot closer to like, let's say a minus one point. 375. So just keep that in mind that this person, it, the left eye, is going to you know require more correction than the right, which is obvious with this, the cylindrical component here. However, always you always want to ask yourself, what is the visual experience? And sometimes you compare the two eyes. Um, and yeah, so that, that helps you in understanding what recommendations you're going to make. In this particular case, this person is just simply myopic. Distance correction is probably all they're going to require. Uh, and that's as simple as that. So no ad power. They're not presbyopic. You see how simple this can be? All right, let's move on to number two. So in this particular case, let's do it a little bit quicker. So we see, all right, plus sphere. This person is hyperopic. They have astigmatism. So this is with astigmatism. And of course, the axis is cor the axis correlates to that. And in this particular case, they've been prescribed uh, two base down prism in the left eye. Therefore, we don't know necessarily in this case what the issue is. However, we know that we have some kind of binocular vision prob. All right, 
That's good. And then if we wanted to dig a little bit deeper as far as what type of uh, astigmatism is present, and I'm going to tell you why in a second, it's important to realize this. So in this particular case, the right eye, OD, we're looking at compounds, hyperopic astigmatism. Again, if you're not sure what I'm doing here, check out the lecture on astigmatism. I don't want to dig too deep into that in this particular lecture. In this particular case, we actually have simple, this is for OS, for the left, simple hyperopic astigmatism. This is hyperopic astigmatism. Again, my apologies about the handwriting. So in this particular case, why is that important? Well, in in the sense of you know visual acuity and ability, the right eye is is going to be you know worse than the left eye. So usually compound astigmatism is going to have a more negative impact on visual acuity, uncorrected anyway, uh, than the left eye. So not that this necessarily comes into play as far as your recommendations. You would still be correcting this person uh, with a single vision pair of glasses. They have no presbyopia, so you're not really concerned about multifocals and things like that. The other thing too is that sometimes patients will say, well, I don't see too bad because in reality, if this person <clears throat> was a young person and they still had full accommodation, they probably wouldn't actually see that bad in the distance you figure the spherical equivalent here actually for the right eye actually reduces the overall hyperopic correction works out to about a plus two spherical equivalent and in simple uh, astigmatism it actually you know the one of the focal line foci actually end up on the retina and the vision is really not that bad so they might feel like they don't need that much correction however with the prism correction in there, it insinuates that there's some kind of binocular vision problem. Therefore, correction is, is definitely necessary to assist in the issue. This person could be getting double vision, could be getting diplopia, could be having some kind of strain. So that prism has been prescribed for a reason and definitely has to be corrected and, and you know, included in the prescription. All right, moving on to example number three. Let's take a look at the prescription. So in this case, again, quickly. All right, so we have myopia. We have astigmatism and astigmatism. What else? No prism, but we also have an ad. So we have presbyopia. See how quickly this gets done? Uh, what type of uh, astigmatism? We have compound astigmatism in both eyes. So this is going to contribute negatively to the overall refractive error. Um, and in reality, uh, that's pretty much it. It's, a, it's that simple. So quick recommendations. Well, we know that this person is going to have poor distance vision due to their, you know, moderate amount of, of myopia. But based on that overall power, we know that near vision is going to actually be pretty good because we've talked about in previous slides or previous lectures that a minus 250 or somewhere around there is actually pretty well suited to about a 40 centimeter focal distance and uh, they're fully presbyopic here. I say fully presbyopic. They have, you know, a, a relatively high presbyopic demand. This person can literally take their glasses off and read absolutely no problem. So recommendations would be, you know, they would vary based on the person's lifestyle and requirements. You could easily fit them with a single vision a uh, pair of glasses and then let them take their glasses off for reading or you could fit them with a multifocal both are completely suitable it really depends on the patient all right so moving on to example four and i knew the pen was going to become an issue so please try to fight through this um we got a little bit more going on here right so this prescription is a little i mean i don't want to say ugly but a little bit more involved so but we could still nail it real fast so okay right eye plus 0.5 and minus 175 in the left. So we'll start with the left. Left eye, myopic, we have some astigmatism here. Therefore, we know that it's, so let's just say OS is myopic with astigmatism. Following the same trends that we've done, let's say it's actually simple. Uh, so, no, not my apologies, it's actually compound myopic astigmatism and we know that there's an ad here so they're also presbyopic now the right eye is a little bit interesting so at first glance you would figure okay the i'm going to actually remove some of this stuff so that we can get it out of the way here so i'm going to erase this stuff out of the way so and i'm going to go to a different color so the right eye we would say oh well they're hyperopic 
Well, I guess if you use the rules that I kind of mentioned before, you would. However, if we look at the cylinder here, the cylinder is quite large. If we kind of operate in the realm of spherical equivalence here, and if we were to calculate the spherical equivalence, so let's just do it real quickly. So you have the sphere of plus 0 0.5 plus half the cylinder, which is a minus 3. We end up, so that works out to minus 150, and we actually end up with a minus 1 spherical equivalent. So again, this is not, we're not correcting in this manner, but you got to kind of understand the overall um, refractive error, the overall experience. So this eye is actually slightly more myopic than it is hyperopic. And it's just based on the fact that we've presented this in a minus cylinder form. You always have to remember what the nature of the power is. So I use this example specifically. This is a pretty involved prescription. And, but the thing is, it's not completely out of the question that you would see something like this. The importance here is that you have to look at the prescription globally and look at what's going on altogether before you make your recommendations. So this patient definitely has a, a you know a sizable difference in power between the two eyes. They have in this case mixed astigmatism in the right eye uh, and compound myopic astigmatism in the left eye. Uh, the recommendations here would be probably to do a multifocal lens. Um, and actually, you know, you could do single vision lens for distance and for near, uh, a, a pair for each. There's a number of different recommendations. But the importance here is that actually one of the most important things to recognize is within seconds, we were able to recognize like, whoa, this is something, there's something significant going on here. You know, they're, they, they've got a hyperopic correction uh, in one eye, but then when you work it out, you kind of figure out that it's actually a little bit more myopic. You've got astigmatism. You've got a sizable amount of astigmatism in the right eye with that three diopters. You've got presbyopia going on. Quickly, we can kind of decipher all the things that are going on. And of course, you've got some time. You don't have to, you know, it's, this isn't like a game show where you have to, you know, spit out your answer as quickly as you can. However, it gives you an opportunity to really recognize just in one glance all the things that are going on. And eventually, uh, with practice, your recommendations will come just as quickly because you kind of get a bit of a feel and a groove for what recommendations work best for what type of patients. All right, let's take a look at a bit of a summary of what we've talked about today. I hope that for all of you, this was informative. And even though you kind of have, a, may have a grasp on this already, hopefully a few things have kind of, uh, helped clarify certain concepts that may have not been as clear before. So first of all, know the prescription layout. Uh, these are easy, low-hanging fruit, meaning uh, it's easy to kind of figure this stuff out. We're going to go cover some more complicated concepts in future lectures. It's best to not get hung up on the simple stuff. Remember that the sphere power uh, usually demonstrates a patient's primary refractive error. Now, of course, Astigmatism and different things like that can also be part of their primary refractive error, but the, in order to be quick and in the in the interest of being quick, recognizing whether a person is myopic or hyperopic can be very effective in just a quick glance. And of course, minus power insinuates myopia and plus power insinuates hyperopia. Uh, cylinder will demonstrate to you that the person does have astigmatism and you want to be able to recognize the difference between simple astigmatism versus compound not necessarily that it's going to impact how you're going to correct them, but it does give you a little bit of an idea of the visual experience. And that does help in your recommendation and always be mindful of the spherical equivalent. This is something that I'm going to hammer home every single lecture because it's a very effective tool in understanding the global refractive error and experience. It's not something we correct. We're never going to be, well, with the exception of maybe in contact lens, um, most of the, in spectacle lenses, you're never going to be correcting simply the spherical equivalent, but it does give you a lot of insight as to what to do next. Remember the ad insinuates presbyopia with the exception of maybe children who are using them for different reasons, a topic we will cover in more detail in the future. And uh, try to remember that myopes versus hyperopes will have a bit of a different ex experience. We just talked about that in the lecture on presbyopia. So if you didn't watch that one, make sure to check it out. However, not every presbyope has the same experience. So try to keep that in mind. Remember that prism is responsible for, or prescribed at least, for binocular vision problems, it cannot be omitted. It has to be corrected. And even sometimes when prescriptions almost seem too low to correct, but PRISM is present, that changes the whole ballgame and you 
therefore should be correcting it. So sometimes you'll see things that have minimal, minimal power. However, prism is prescribed. The prism now becomes the major point of interest and the reason the person is wearing correction. And that does it for the lecture on Rx interpretation. I hope you enjoyed it. I know that for some of you, this may have been pretty simple stuff. However, like I said a couple times, it never hurts to go over the simple stuff because, um, well, sometimes it's just nice to hear it in a different way. And uh, for those of you that these concepts were new, uh, great. Now you've got them under your belt and it's something that you can practice and continue to get better at. And you've got the background or at least the foundation needed to understand a lot of the other lectures we'll be doing. So, like I said, I hope you enjoyed it and I can't wait to see you in the next one. All right, I hope you enjoyed today's video. And always make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so that you get all the weekly content as it drops. And also make sure to check out modernoptician.com for books and study guides and all the help you need to pass your national examinations. I can't wait to see you in the next one.